John, how you doing? How you doing, Glenn? I'm all right. Glenn Lowry here, bloggingheads.tv, with my colleague, my friend, and my Blogging Heads conversation partner, John Warder of Columbia University. I happen to teach at Brown University. We are the self-styled black guys at bloggingheads.tv, and we are here um, on a Friday after a Monday, I believe it was, when uh, the... It's funny, Glenn, I can't imagine. We don't really have much to talk about this time, do we? <laughs> <laughs> the black guys... <laughs> Where race and politics is our beat, would appear to have a, a, a surplus of uh, fr red meat to, to bite into here, so to speak. Uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, the um, white supremacists demonstrating against the removal of Confederate statue and renaming of a park in Charlottesville. They come in from all over the country. They have a torch lit uh march the uh, reminiscent of uh, the height of the you know, nazi party uh mass mobilizations in germany in the 1930s they marched through the streets with torches the night before and the day of they engage in uh they they they, they uh, present themselves uh with uh, open bearing openly bearing arms and carrying weapons and encounter uh resistance people who have come there specifically to counter demonstrate and violence breaks out. And if I say that it came from both sides, I'll be in trouble with everybody. But let's just say there was enough violence to go around inst instigated by uh, these white supremacists who came to, uh, to uh, fly their flag and uh, strut their stuff. Uh, President Trump uh, mishandles his responsibilities of office, which first and foremost... I don't ask you to agree with this. I'm just trying to lay the stage. You'll have your chance to rebut. First and foremost is to calm the waters in a circumstance like that, to bring us all together and to at least point the way toward higher ground if he couldn't lead us there by the hand. Instead, uh, he splits the difference between, quote, the two sides in the conflict, so, quote, and pr uh, it, uh, produces a firestorm of objection and protest in response to that with people resigning from commissions left and right and a universal contempt uh, conveyed by uh, the uh, press and reaction to President Trump. Republicans as well as Democrats, they could be expected to the Democrats, but many uh, prominent Republicans uh, also speaking out that the president is not uh, living up to his responsibility to lead the country and so forth. So, and I'll stop. Uh, this is the circumstance before us right now, and uh, we've been uh, flirting with uh, the possibilities of civil disorder and violence over political issues ever since uh, the election of Donald Trump to office. And uh, we now seem to have arrived at a critical moment. And uh, I don't know what wisdom you have, John. I'm feeling inadequate to the, to the circumstance, but I'll do my best. It's what we have to talk about today. <coughs> well, you know, I... I think that a lot of the theme that we're hearing is that we're supposed to be afraid that these troglodytes are about to start a war, that we're going to have this ongoing battle against armed, unreconstructed racists. And I understand the slippery slope argument. I understand that we have to try to learn from history. I understand the Nazi analogy. But to tell you the truth, I don't, I don't see those, those men... As in, you know, from what I can see, this is a, a mostly male endeavor. I don't see them as winners. They don't have the look of victory on their faces. They have <laughs> about them the general air of losers. And many people will rush and say, well, you know, the, the numbers of such people have been increasing. Ever since Obama was elected, people who are charged to do these things have been noticing an increase in hate groups. And my analogy to that, and I don't mean this facetiously, is that... Today, there are silent film societies. And films aren't silent. There are people who love silent films and watch them every day. There are more now than there were 25 years ago. That doesn't mean every now and then a silent film gets made. That doesn't mean that silent films are on their way back in or they're going to take over. It's that there are certain people who cherish them or hold on to them because they have receded or, you know, in the past it would have been our receding. I see these guys as the, the same thing, and I think that to draw an analogy between Nazi Germany and now, 
doesn't work partly because of the vast numbers of and influence of the people who are calling attention to the analogy. It seems that there is so very much resistance, and not just on the street with this, you know, quote-unquote, violent alt-left, but just all of the rest of us who are deeply frightened and fully aware and are not going to be swayed by such people. So I see it as a rather, a rather unnerving minority of people who seem to have been given a certain voice by certain things that the president and some of his allies have said, although, as I always say, I think the power of social media has a lot to do with it, too. I don't know if this wouldn't have happened if somebody other than Trump was president. But, yeah, this is, it's disturbing, but the notion that we're on our way to something out of a Marvel comic book, I don't see it yet, and I'm willing to be proven wrong. I see these as loud losers. Uh, let me just uh, uh, throw something in the mix here. 2000, the year is 2000, mm -hmm. uh, John McCain is in a heated primary campaign with George W. Bush in South Carolina. He's trying to be president. There is a controversy in South Carolina about a Confederate flag flying in front of the state house or on uh, government property in South mm -hmm. Carolina. John McCain, in his effort to get to George W. Bush's right, and win that critical Republican primary, comes out in favor of the people, the side, advocating on behalf of maintaining the Confederate flag. He subsequently, after the election, apologized for mm. that position. Mm -hmm. Yours truly, I say humbly, had a piece in the New York Times right around the time that John McCain was taking that position saying, shame, 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 Senator McCain because McCain had called attention to the fact that his ancestors, some of them, had served honorably uh, in the uh, Army of the Confederacy during the mm -hmm. conflict, which we call the Civil War. Uh, and my point was, uh, let me stipulate that your ancestors were honorable people. The cause on behalf of which they labored and some died was not an honorable cause. It was a cause of rebellion against the government of which you would be the president. And there's only one position against rebellion against the government of which you would be the president, which is that the right side won that war, the rebels were put down, and it's a good thing too. So uh, shape up Senator McCain. Now I'm saying all that to agree with you. I don't know if the analogy silent films really works if we press on it, but the, <laughs> I, <laughs> but the idea that people, there's a nostalgia uh, mm -hmm. uh, aspect and an identity aspect to mm -hmm. it, um, and that uh, uh, people's feelings are hurt to the extent that they can't be affirmed in their nostalgic and identitarian uh, impulses uh, is, is certainly an element here. That doesn't mean that the statue should stay up, and I think we ought to actually talk about that, um, but it, it does allow some room for the possibility. I mean, after all, this Senator John McCain, the same one that everybody loves today because he stopped uh, the Obamacare repeal from happening, and they love him because he speaks out against Donald Trump's uh, inadequacies with regularity, and they love him because he spoke in this particular instance against the uh, ineffective response that the president made uh, in his awesome uh, office, uh, not, of, not of the chief executive officer, but of the head of state. He, he's our Queen Elizabeth. I mean, he's all we got as, as far as the figurehead of uh, personification of the state is concerned, and uh, more was required of him than what he was able to deliver. Still, um, I want to say, uh, you know, the idea that some people were out there, not the fascist guys, not the fascists, that some people were out there saying, don't take down those statues because we have nostalgia and we, we want to remember our history, we want to remember our, quote, our fallen dead, close quote, we mm -hmm. want to remember our lost cause, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that has to be an offense to everybody else who doesn't share that value. I, 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 and I'll stop. I really want to hear from you. I wonder if we can't find a way of kind of living and let live, live and let live in this thing. You honor your dead in your way. I'll honor my dead in mine. Though when it comes to public present presentation and public ceremony and so forth, we're all there's only going to be one government and. Uh, there can only be one park and, and so on. So I don't know, maybe I'm a bit confused about it, but I'm, I'm uneasy with the position that um, if you wanted to see Robert E. Lee as a hero, 
then you're you're really a, a, a bad person. You're a neo-fascist. You're somebody who uh, is uh, beneath contempt and deserves not to be taken uh, uh, with any uh, more as as possessing any moral, uh, you know, compass or or something like that. Yeah, um, it's interesting. I differ from you a little bit on this in that I see the whole issue of Confederate monuments and this would include the flag as a separate case. And I think a lot of people see sloppy reasoning in this as they have seen sloppy reasoning in my saying we've had bad presidents, but Trump is absolutely awful. And I would be I would let wink something getting rid of him that maybe everybody didn't quite agree with. I don't mean the legality of. But if something got rid of him where not everybody thought that it should have, I would be fine with that having happened by any – no, by any means necessary is sloppy. With that having happened because I think that he really is an egregious mistake. Some people say, no, you can't single him out. He was elected fair and square. Here, too, I think that there's something to be said for the beautiful and crucial moral evolution that the civil rights revolution entailed. The idea that a people are oppressed – and the wider society, the people who pull the levers of power, are moved to make things much easier for them out of a sense that all people really are equal. You and I talk about it so much, we're part of it, that it can seem almost a tired notion. But that was big. That was, and it's something that happened here in America. It didn't happen somewhere else. I think that to the extent that there are monuments that are celebrating people who devoted themselves to keeping black people in bondage. I think that that falls on the certain side of a line. Robert E. Lee on a horse bucking up and looking glorious. No, I think that, no, those that, that has to come down. Now, Donald Trump asked where it's going to stop. And, you know, we have to give up the idea that he's going to be any kind of moral uniter. It's basically Archie Bunker speaking. And let's face it, Archie Bunker is a very common person. Where is it going to stop? Okay, well... Not George Washington, not Thomas Jefferson. Whoa, 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 people... whoa. I'm sorry to interrupt. Al Sharpton told Charlie Rose just yesterday mm -hmm. that he thinks public funding for the Jefferson Memorial should be withdrawn. No. See, that's... that's I'm, I'm just much. saying. Yeah, I get, I get it. That's taking it too far. That's, I mean, Reverend Al, that's, you need to reconsider. <laughs> because those people did something else other than holding slaves. If you were a slaveholder, it was very easy not to question that. Society hadn't advanced to a point, especially when you're talking about the late 1700s. Those people, Jefferson, Washington, did a whole lot else that we can celebrate where we need to bend our minds around not being presentist. And anybody who can't do that is just looking for something to be upset about. But when it comes to Robert E. Lee or Jefferson Davis, no, because Robert E. Lee didn't leave us anything except what he did in the war. I think oh, on the no, Confederate no, flag, no, just going very quickly, on the Confederate flag, okay. I understand that those people, there's a part of them that wants to be able to celebrate the South without thinking about the slavery. They want to think about the other cultural aspects. I think they need to design a new flag. I, I think that's really the solution. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, that's an idea. I had never... It needs to uh, come I've never up more heard, I've never heard that before. Uh, and, and, and maybe I'll have something to say about it when I give it some thought. No, I was just going to say uh, on Robert E. Lee's behalf <laughs> that he had been commandant at West Point before uh, and, and a major general in the United States Army before he went back to his beloved home state of Virginia yeah. uh, after secession. Um, that um, uh, he was... Uh, a revered figure in the South in the immediate years after the war, not mainly for his uh, 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 fighting on behalf of the preservation of slavery, but uh, because of the uh, the nature of the sacrifices that he had made. I mean, he was uh, president of the Washington and Lee University. The trustees changed the name of the university uh, uh, in order to honor him. Uh, he was one of Virginia's uh, uh, heroic sons. I, I, I'm not a Virginian. I don't have any particular brief for Robert E. Lee, but certainly uh, he shouldn't be remembered only for the fact that he led this. I, I don't know where he stood on secession, for example. That, I, I mean, mm -hmm. that's at least worth knowing. Uh, was he in favor of secession? Was he a rabid secessionist? Or did he, out of a sense of duty to his beloved Virginia, 
uh, leave his commission in the United States Army and return to Virginia to lead the um, lead the Confederate Army. Uh, he did what not, he had to do. Notwithstanding the fact that he might have thought secession was a mistake, um, he yeah. he uh, uh, was uh, the agent or one of the principal agents of the surrender at Appomattox when others in the Confederate leadership ranks wanted to keep the fight going, and that would have meant who knows how many thousands of additional uh, lives that would have been lost and so forth. He's a defeated enemy, beloved by some of the people in the region that he served. The war is over. It's been over for yeah. a century and a half. That, that, war. That, that statue's been there for decades. And Washington and Lee University, ought they to be changing their names now? Yes. I, that, oh, war was about keeping, that war was about keeping our ancestors in bondage. And everything John else that Robert E. That. Lee did, apparently he was a very gracious man. Frankly, there were a lot of gracious mans back in the 1800s. But all the things that you mentioned that he did, it sounds like he was a good bank president. Those things alone are not worth the statue. It was because of what he did in, in the war. And he, didn't, he doesn't sound like he was a, a slavering racist. There are things that he said that people tended to say then. But, you know, he didn't assume that black people were inferior. But what he fought for was disgusting. He did it because he felt he didn't have any choice, but no statues. He had to. He would have had to have done something else. He would have to have been a, a great scientist. He would have to have given humanity something to deserve that statue, that cause that they're talking about. No, there's, I think that we can definitely draw a line there. What a, oh, okay, I, I, let me put Lee to the side for a minute. I don't agree with you about this, but... Uh... I'm not sure we're going to shed any greater light by, by continuing to argue it. Uh, what about the dead in the cemeteries? What about the Confederate cemeteries? Where, Isn't where it the tragic war dead that are buried? The personal should, should I? No, let, let me just finish. When I go to Gettysburg, all right, where those thousands who were slaughtered in that uh, epic battle uh, lay, where they fell, where Abraham Lincoln gave that famous speech in 1863, um, and I walk amongst the graves mm -hmm. of the Confederate church. Should I be spitting on them? Oh, no. Well, but why Those... not? They were fighting for a system that enslaved your ancestors and mine. Yeah, they had to. They were caught up in something larger than themselves, as was Lee. Well, but he led. Well, but Lee well, led. Well, he's a leader. There shouldn't be a statue of him. That's all. He should be in the history books. Those poor, Glenn, you know there, all those Matthew Brady photos. There is a statue of him, and there's a university, a major research university named after him. Oh, sitting that's Right there in his home state. And the question, <laughs> is, the, the question is not, are we erecting a statue to him? The question is, <laughs> but are, was we, it there? are we tearing it down? Are we tearing it down over the objection of some significant plurality of our, of, of our fellow citizens? Mm, uh, some plurality. And, and, and on behalf of what? What's the principle? The principle is that we advanced morally as a people in freeing black people from bondage. And therefore, we can't have celebrations of people who felt the other way standing for posterity just because it hurts some people's feelings to see oh, something big and metal fall down. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. We can't, we can't celebrate the lives of people who believe things that we now understand to be morally wrong. What about all the homophobes in our history? No, 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 no. No, you remember, my point is not that everybody who we would find offensive needs to have their names taken off of buildings. I've argued in print quite often that that ends up just becoming this ridiculous kind of whack-a-mole game. I'm talking very specifically. Uh, for example, homophobia, that would frankly be everybody before about 10 minutes ago. I Correct. mean Correct. somebody who led in <laughs> the Civil War. No statue for you. That does not work. <laughs> I mean, if I see a Matthew Brady photograph uh, of some soldier laying dead in the grass, and it's a southern one, I always think to myself, one, it's sad that somebody's son died. Two, isn't it sad that he had to die fighting something as indisputably reprehensible morally as the South's cause in the Civil War? But nobody puts up a statue of, of Johnny Red. We're not putting up the statue. We're taking it down. It was, it's been there for decades. But I mean... He, doesn't, he never had a statue put up for him, and so we don't have to think about but it. But I do think my point is leader. important. The action in question is to take down a memorial that has been, uh, you know, that is uh, 
uh, a standing uh, fait accompli. What do you think is, what, what do we get from keeping it up? Um, we get <laughs> the continuity of our history. We get, uh, I, well, let me stop because I'm, I'm not in favor of raising a statue to Robert E. Lee, but I'm very, I I, I, I'm, I'm very worried about this um, uh, uh, vengeance. There's a kind of inevitable, uh, yes. You know, and and to what end? I mean, I, I it's a distraction in my mind from uh, what are the uh, central mm. political issues that we face. It's gratuitous. Uh, yeah. And and uh, you know, I, like I say, I think Sharpton's uh, recent action is just. Uh, uh, you know, exemplifies the point. It, it is, um, it, it's grinding an axe, it's, it's a seizing upon a symbolic uh, ground of battle. Uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's... every analogy that I think of is unacceptable. I think about, I, I, I think about uh, a radical Islamic sect blowing up the Hindu or Buddhist relics in their midst because mm -hmm. those people were um, apostates and they didn't believe in the one true God. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the, the retroactive projection of contemporary morality back into mm -hmm. history and the sanitizing uh, of, our, of the uh, of physical, material, uh, historical um, uh, inheritance uh, and of course sat sanitizing of the narrative, right? There, there can't be any novels about the heroic uh, loss of life in the Confederacy now, right? There could be Colson Whitehead's brilliant uh, uh, fantasy about the Underground Railroad, but there can't be any, and, and yet the human experience of the pathos, the suffering, the loss, uh, uh, the pain, uh, and all of that uh, had its uh, Confederate element. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the people who today can identify with that, I mean, uh, I, I, I'm, you know, I, I, I would be more generous, okay? That, 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 yeah. I, I'm not really disputing the substantive judgment about the morality, but yeah. we can afford to be more generous, live and let live. We can afford, and, and, and in fact, that goes so far as to say, I think the reason why a symbolic issue of this kind is able to garner such intensity it's because people are uh, pretty much uh, at sea with respect to the uh, substantive things that might be done yeah. to address the legacies of slavery and so forth. We, we, we don't quite know anymore what to do. We've lost faith in policy as an ordinary instrument of uh, reconciliation and improvement, and, and, and we're not into politics anymore. We're, uh, with your colleague Mark Lilla, I'm, I'm going to agree that we're into a kind of uh, pseudo-politics. We're we're into a politics of uh, fit throwing and 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 uh, remonstration and uh, uh, you know I'm in pain I'm in pain I'm in pain. Uh, you know what? It's a it, this this <laughs> is where you're taking me on this and why I I feel rather strongly about these monuments. There's a part of me, I think what we're really both saying is what is so important about some piece of metal being up when there are practical things to be dealt with, such as what Mark Lilla is addressing, and the New York Times review of his book was deeply unfair, for the, for the record. And for I haven't seen it, but I'm glad you said so. I haven't seen he the got, review. He, I've read the book, and I think it's brilliant. It was really not fair. But yes, you and I are thinking, who cares about the damn statue? And yet there are a great many people who feel much differently, and they're not going to stop. My take on the race issue ever since I jumped into this in the year 2000 has always been there are real things that need to be done. They seem to be rather feasible, but it seems that our best and brightest are awfully caught up in certain aspects of theatrics. And I found when I looked into these things and I was trying to figure out why is it that I feel like lots of progress has been made and other people who've had the same life I have seem to think we're still living in 1960. I always thought, no, they're not crazy. That's not intellection. They're not crazy at all. But why is it that I can't see it their way because I'm not crazy either? And the main thing that I discovered was the police. I noticed hmm, this problem with the cops 
keeps nine out of ten people concerned with this from looking at the real things. And so I've always been very devoted to the idea that we've got to solve that because it would open up the air and make people look at something else. Barack Obama gets elected, for example, and I thought, wow, that will turn people's heads and make them realize that we're closer to the mountaintop than we've said. And it didn't. During Barack Obama's presidency, people got even more focused on the cops. This monument thing, and correct me if I'm wrong, because sometimes I lack imagination. A lot I lack imagination. This monument thing is the second thing, and I'm not sure if there's anything else. If, okay, we tear these statues down, if we get rid of the effing flag, which means a great deal to a lot of people, and it's going to keep meaning a lot to a lot of people. Get rid of those. What other thing, if you could get rid of the problem with the cops and the problem with these Confederate symbols, would a certain kind of person be able to look to and perform about as opposed to actually solving problems that poor black people have? I can't think of anything else. Well, you and I both know they'll find something. And I really can't think of anything, but maybe they would. Well, would you, really... would you have thought of the monuments before when you only had the cops? <laughs> I would not have come up with that 15 years ago. No. But there's a part of me that wants to take these distractions away from people who could be exerting their energies in some other way. Trump, that, that, I admit that's part of why I feel this way. It seemed to me Trump asked a good question. I watched that uh, press conference in press conference that he gave a couple of times. Um, I didn't have the impression that so many people have said about it that he was endorsing somehow or giving aid and comfort to white nationalists. He did say that decent people oppose removing that statue and that they have a right to do that and their, their view should be regarded as, 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 uh, as relevant as anyone else's views. I never heard him say anything to the, in fact, I heard him say exactly the opposite of it. Uh, but he was inarticulate and he was combative and uh, the interaction with the press was an important part of that. Press conference questions were being shouted at him. He was reacting spontaneously. He shouldn't do that. God knows the president of the United States should not be venting at a podium when billions of people in principle are watching him. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult uh, choreography to be the head of state in front of a camera. It's, it's, it's uh, as challenging an acting role as anybody is ever likely to be uh, confronted with. And uh, Donald Trump is not equipped uh, to perform that role with grace uh, and, and with a kind of uh, uh, subtlety and, you know, economy of gesture and, and phrase and a kind of wisdom. And he doesn't have the, not only is it the temperament, he doesn't have the, you know, he's not steeped in the scripture. I went back and reread Obama's speech in Dallas after those five cops were shot down at a Black Lives Matter demonstration by a black, I guess you can call him a terrorist. I think you'd have to, a guy with a rifle killing people from a, a perch is, you know, what, what are you gonna call him? He's a black guy and he was killing them and he was mad at him because of cops killing unarmed black men. And um, uh, although it should be mentioned that both Alton Sterling and Philando Castile, the two whose deaths occasioned that demonstration in Dallas were armed at the time that they were shot. But see, facts like that would just uh, infuriate people. But in any case, I digress. Obama's speech was so graceful. I mean, he, he, it, it was, uh, uh, the speech was about <clears throat> hope. And he said, people suffer as the families of these fallen officers suffer now. And he said, quoting scripture, suffering brings perseverance. Persever perseverance builds character. And character leads to hope. And he, had, and he had that sort of thematic structure to the phrase. He went on to name each of the five officers who had fallen uh, individually and to talk about their circumstances and their family. Uh, he went on to, I think his critics, Heather McDonald among them would say, he did kind of say there were two sides to the thing. He did juxtapose the shooting of those cops with the shooting of Castile and, uh, and Sterling. Uh, and as I know, you know, tribunals determined at the end of the day that those shootings were not of such a nature that the cops should be punished for having done them which means that they were not the equivalent of the murdering of the five cops, et cetera, et cetera. But there was no way that anyone would come away from Obama's speech saying, he has a, no moral compass, he's degrading the lives of the fallen cops or something like that. It was subtlety um, and, and, and grace uh, and um, a, uh, uh, erudition. Uh, he and or his speech writers, a, a kind of equation with our moral canon uh, 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 acquaintance 
acquaintance with our moral canon that allowed mm -hmm. him to do it. And Trump doesn't have any of these things. Um, you know, he's a guy who comes into office with people like you, calling him a sexual predator. Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody says he's a racist. He's a, mm -hmm. an anti-Semite. Uh, he, mm -hmm. he countenances neo-fascism. Uh, and he's he's dumb as a box of hair. Don't forget the intelligence. Ah, man, I don't think that guy is dumb. Come on, he oh. doesn't have to be dumb in order to be off base on all these. Dumb? I don't. I don't believe he's dumb. That's the most economical argument. <laughs> I, I, I don't think he's. Dumb. You could have a better conversation with a spoon. No, he's he's dumb. <laughs> it, it makes it all. I, I it makes it all so I don't easy. believe Donald Trump is dumb, man. So you're saying why can't we think of Donald Trump as having just addressed both sides? And once again, I say that there are certain lines that one does not cross. In this case, what he was saying was that people who are devoted to an angry white-led takeover of the country against you and me and all of our relatives, people who are in favor of that, should be given a bit of a pass, the idea being to say, that, say that not – wait, wait, wait – that not all of them are Nazis – so, you know, let's not call them dirty names and implying that some of those people were therefore not as bad as we're saying. Talk about the leadership. Uh, he didn't that... say that. Straightforwardly, he said, the fight there is over the preservation of that monument. There are decent people on the side of preserving it, just like there are decent people on the side of taking it down. There was violence. Some of the violence came from one side. Some of the violence came from the other side. That's true, in my mm -hmm. judgment. Those uh, statements are statements of fact. Now, now, he wasn't simply a journalist reporting facts. He was the president of the United States presiding over the nation's processing of trauma. More was required of him than to make what might be argued to be factually true statements. Moral leadership was required of him. He didn't and rise to the, to the occasion. He did not rise to the occasion. Now, it was more than not rising for him in that position to just make the simple utterance that Confederate monuments are beautiful and just leaving it there. Remember, he wasn't saying that in some kind of irony. He wasn't using it as a preface to explaining how a Southerner might feel about the monuments to larger things than slavery. He's just saying that they're pretty. This is what I mean about the dumb thing. I'm not saying that to be recreational. What he sees is that those are pretty pieces of art. You know, a lot of, metal a lot of, and, a lot of and people bronze. like those monuments, John. A lot of people mm -hmm. like those monuments. But the president is not tens supposed of, to insert Tens of that. millions of your fellow citizens like those monuments. He, was making, that the, wasn't this, the time. he was making the distinction between liking those monuments and mowing down a crowd with a vehicle. Not the time to say that. I agree and with he, that. I, even I mean, he, come on. We, we, even we, if he lacks poetry. <laughs> we, we agree that he fumbled the ball, man. In the, mm -hmm. and, and the thing that he needed to accomplish was bringing the country together. He has everything stacked against him, including his own history, okay? including mm -hmm. the enmity that is directed at him from just about every institutional quarter outside of the Republican Party, and from there as well. He's got a lot of stuff going against him. He needed to have had a very beautiful speech, not a beautiful monument, but a beautiful speech. But of course, the point of the, the press gathering was not to discuss uh, Charlottesville. The point of the press gathering was to discuss his so-called infrastructure stuff. And then he starts winging it in response to the press's questions, and it, get, and it, it got out Glenn, of control. Glenn, can we, can we agree on this? The way yeah. it should have come out, like the way that he fumbled, was that it should have come out that he felt that the Nazis were more reprehensible than the Antifa people. That's the way it was supposed to come out. Yeah. No, 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 wait, wait. Yeah. He didn't have to say it poetically. To be perfectly honest, with Obama, the oratory is something that I thought was beautiful enough. Talk about beautiful. But I always find that side of him a little fake because I believe that his Christianity was put on at a certain point. I'm sure that at this point it comes naturally to him. But he didn't grow up with it, and I think he's learned that it creates a mood. So for me, I always kind of listened past that when Barack Obama talked. I'm, I admire him massively, but that to me was a little bit, not just theatrical, but I heard it as a bit of an act. If Trump had gotten up and just said some flinty things in a thoroughly unpoetic way, but it, it with his flinty self basically said, these people have got to go. 
it's repulsive. And maybe he could have even stuck in some codicil about the other side. But if he had walked away having, in essence, condemned the Nazis, that would be fine. Instead, he really left it as both sides. That's what everything he said implied. It wasn't just the words both sides. Okay, I let, think that was the mistake. Let me bracket Charlottesville for a moment. Because the thing I'm about to say, I would never say in the context of Charlottesville. There's a problem of political violence in this country, and that problem is on both sides of the ideological spectrum. There's a problem with things getting potentially out of hand. We could find ourselves uh, sliding into some kind of religious slash race war in this country. And to the extent that we do, I mean, we could tick off the instances of violence which have come from the left. And we do know that there were people in Charlottesville, I do mention Charlottesville here briefly, who came from the left and who came looking for trouble. That's true. Okay, that should never have been uh, enunciated in the context of the murder. I agree. Of a of a progressive uh, activist who happened to be out there by fascists. Yeah, that was not the time to say that. But it is true that the problem that we face, the potentially lethal problem our country faces, involves political violence, and that, that political violence comes from both sides. Remember, leaders of Congress who are Republicans being attempted to be assassinated right there in Washington, D.C. Remember black masked, uh, bat wielding um, Antifa types chasing uh, Brett Weinstein around the campus of Evergreen State University or uh, turning over cars and smashing windows in Berkeley, California when Milo Yiannopoulos tried to speak or attacking uh, uh, Charles Murray and his uh, academic uh, host uh, on the campus of Middlebury College and so forth and so on. Um, if you look at your Twitter feed carefully or you follow some of this discussion at the uh, discussion boards and so forth on the left, there's a lot of hatred out there. OK, uh, so that bit is true. Mm. But but making that point in the context of conducting your presidential responsibilities in the aftermath of the tragedy of Charlottesville was a grave error. That, that would you know, be my gonna, position. I'm going to go out on a limb here. This is really a limb. All of those episodes that you described, if I'm not mistaken, are ones where the, the person in question did not actually get hurt. That is not to condone any of this you know, Middlebury-style violence with people walking around with clubs and things and making a lot of noise. Well, in hurt, terms it depends of, on what oh, you mean no, by hurt. Guns. I mean, some, some people, people did get hurt. The, some people did one, get that hurt. Was, that one was striking because it actually resulted in somebody getting severely injured. It seems to me that Generally, when we're talking about something absolutely horrific in this country so far, it's going to be from a Dylan Roof or what happened in Charlottesville rather than from the left. And the right is regularly threatening leftist professors, making death threats, whereas the left style seems to be to get a bunch of youngish people together with some clubs and making a lot of noise and making a lot of gestures. It seems to me that the right at this point is more violent and more menacing than the left. Yeah, that could change. Yeah, I, but I, I don't know that. But but it, that could change. But it seems to I, me that you know I, I don't know. I'm, that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how productive that is. Dylan, right, Roof. We, we we want to kill. We want to condemn the violence on all sides, on many many sides. The president said. I mean, Glenn, you and I are also kind of thinking about rhetorical violence which the left is quite guilty of, with the shutting down of discussion and the sneering John, and the smearing. a sitting state representative currently holding office in Missouri, an African-American woman has called for Donald Trump to be assassinated on her Facebook page. She's been condemned yeah. by Claire McCaskill and others for having but she done said so. It. She, yes, said but she said it. it. She said, I wish that he were assassinated or words to that effect. John... If a sitting elected official at the state level had called for the assassination of Barack Obama, do you think we wouldn't be reading about it for a month? No, well, we'd be reading about it now. John, and let me just yes. tell you, if Trump is assassinated, John, the streets in this country are going to run with blood. In a two dozen cities, there are going to be pitch battles and people will be bleeding out on the curb. No, they wouldn't. Oh, John. I don't think so. Oh, John. You really think that would it would bring out people who would be that angry and that violent? I, I fear if, it. I think we t uh, we we are at the uh, edge of a, a cliff and we're about to step off of it and find out that the law of gravity is still 
uh, working. You know what, Glenn? In a way, I wish that that would happen, not for Trump's sake. I kind of like the idea of these people bringing their views out into the open, not killing people, beating people up. But a lot of people say, now these people feel emboldened to speak out in the open. And I'm thinking, good. It takes away some of the energy that people exert in trying to find through tests and implications how these people feel. Oh, it's out there. Okay, now the, the more what, of them are saying it. Wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. And I think I would really like to see, let's say that there's this civil war in the streets. <laughs> a lot of them would be eliminated or they would be rendered such that they would not be speaking out again. And I think that we would gradually learn that they are a minority. You make it sound like it would be every second house in every second suburb in the United States. I don't think there are that many of them. You want to you purge know? them? You you want to flush them out? It's it's like if I have a, a it wouldn't fever be the or worst thing. Sweat it, it wouldn't out. be the yep. It wouldn't be the worst. John, thing. you're a madman. <laughs> no, I just want us to get past this impasse. <laughs> but I don't think it would be that way. Mike Pence would become president, and we just kind of sweat it out, basically. No, uh, I think that uh, we would find ourselves on a slippery slope to a very bad place. I'd like to see it. I would like all, you know how people say that, well, it's, it's better in the South because at least they're honest about the racism. In a way, I wish that this race war were more honest. I think that, remember that putrid views when aired are easier to refute, easier to convince other people not to subscribe to. I would rather hear these people speak their minds than to only talk to each other on the internet and for people to be warning us about what's going on in the background. I'd rather, you know, br please, bring it out, let us refute you, and frankly, you know, if you're well, you threatening, if they're threatening violence, come on, if, if they're going to do it, come on, do it now. Let, let, let's get it over with. Come and, you know, give us your best shot. You know, are they going to stay suppressed forever? I'm talking nonsense to an extent. I mean, if they're yes. talking about true carnage, but I don't see it. Well, I don't know. No, if that no. were going to happen, why wouldn't it have happened already? All it would take is a wink from Donald Trump? Wouldn't they have come out 20 years ago? What, what was holding them back? You, you know what you sound like? You sound like somebody sitting in 1965, 6, 7, 8, watching cities burn all around the country from the element, that element, this right-wing, conservative, mm -hmm. suburban-dwelling, Archie Bunker type, mm -hmm. would say. And he'd say, let him come out. Let it rage. Let's fight it out. Let's get it over with. Uh, and I would distinguish between, on the one hand, an open expression of your noxious view. Absolutely. Let's not mince any words about that. Let me know where you're coming from so that we can know who the enemy is and understand him. No euphemisms involved. I distinguish between that, on the one hand, and actually slugging it out on the street. You want vigilante groups of people with open carry roaming around inner city communities looking for the, well, uh, Rahm Emanuel won't lock them up. Well, the city council won't do anything about it. Well, the police are handcuffed because of the Ferguson effect, but I tell you what, I got a weapon and I know how to use it. Me and my boys are going out tonight and we're hunting the thugs, the murderers, the drug dealers, uh, the, the Sinaloa cartel, the MS-13, whatever, whatever. We're going out, we're going to hunt them, and when we find them, we're going to blow their brains out, as in some kind of Clint Eastwood movie. We don't want that, John. And I understand that, but... Very few of those people would watch it happen next month. Very few of those people would go that far because they would go to jail or be killed themselves. That's what keeps people from doing it. And once again, why haven't they already done it? I mean, in terms of the social media revolution, it's about 10 years old at this point. And so these people have been roiling and increasing ever since one Obama comes in. But the cause was Facebook and Twitter. Wouldn't they have gotten around to it by now? Was the idea that the president hasn't winked at us and so we feel kind of repressed? No. They the, would have done it. The idea is that the, the norms of restraint that hold civilization together are fragile. Sorry to be lecturing you. I know you've read these books. That's okay. I know you've read these books. <laughs> but maybe everybody out there has it. <laughs> I mean, it is an achievement, social order. It's an achievement it's to be fragile. able to lose an election and go back and fight it out another day rather than taking to the streets. It's an achievement to suffer the loss of a loved one at the hands of a despicable act and to accept the judgment of the court as final in the matter. These things are not given in nature. They are no. uh, hard They're not natural. 
they are hard wrought products of, of a, a civil society that has uh, developed a, a set of uh, norms and restraints that allow it to function. Not only what's the law on the books, but what's in the hearts of the people. And that's the thing that we're mucking around with here. Uh, and, and I just don't think the uh, legitimate concerns of us who descend from slaves, both about the historical narrative of our country and also about the current conditions of our people, warrant to go over the line uh, and invite that kind of violence. And, and those on the other side who want to do it, ought to uh, want to do something similar, ought to be dealt with extremely harshly. They ought to be dealt with harshly. But we shouldn't invite that. And we, we, and we shouldn't pick gratuitous fights that have no political value for the pure symbolic uh, pleasure of being able to thumb our noses at those who don't share our views about matters. Let me clean up what I was saying, because you're making, very, you're making a very important point. It's not the violence that I really wish would happen. That's, that's childish. Okay. I, like you, agree, however, that they should be able to express their views, partly because it leaves them open to being refuted, and partly because it releases a kind of a pressure. A lot of them are angry that they can't speak out. Well, let them speak out, and maybe they'll feel a little better. And I also think that if people like that I mean, they would calm down a little bit, and if not, if people like that could really speak out, I think it could become graphically clear that they are not a majority. And as to them uprising, upon reflection, sitting here right now, I really think that would have happened already, especially within the past 10 years. What we do have to be afraid of is the occasional renegade. And so, Dylan Roof being an example, there's no reason why there will be only one of him now, or this person who gets in a car and runs people over there's no reason to think that that might not happen again but i imagine it's going to be the occasional it's going to be the, a nut job it's not going to be the sorts of riots against black neighborhoods that were a regular aspect of american life until roughly the 1930s i don't see that happening partly because it hasn't happened in an awfully long time something seems to hold it back it's not going to be communal individual sure yeah Especially you, with our gun laws. You know that, uh, I'm sure you know that um, in many states which have large prison populations, the prisons are basically governed by racially uh, defined like gangs. Attica. Yeah. Like Attica. Or, you know, in California and, and uh, so forth, by racially defined gangs who mm -hmm. are, um, you know, they recruit the people when they first come in. And if you're black, you have to go to this one. And if you're a Mexican from this part of Mexico, you go to that one and so mm -hmm. forth. If you're white when the skinheads and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that is that structure of racial conflict is pretty much confined to uh, prisons now. To prison. But it doesn't have to stay that way. You know. Um, when those people come out, the last thing they want to do is wind up back in. Yeah, kill. well, the, the, the organizational structure that would, that would knit them together and mobilize them in the ideological over uh, uh, view that would uh, give them some, you know, thin patina of, of uh, justification uh, don't yet exist. Uh, but, mm -hmm. but we seem to be moving in that direction. Oh, by the way, I just saw in my news feed that Steve Bannon is out. That happened, what, a few hours ago? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Uh, Good idea. Glenn, I've got to go make dinner yeah. for my girls. Yeah. And so uh, I think, I think we, 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 we went through it. it. We both made enough trouble for one session of uh, blogging hits. Uh, we did. You inviting we civil did. war in order to purge the racists from our midst, and me agreeing with Donald <laughs> Trump that there were two sides to the conflict in Charlottesville. God help us. And watch your back, by the way. Do you have uh, security, man? Um, I'm beginning to think about it. <laughs> and the comment section is definitely going to be interesting for this one. <laughs> Take care, my Well, we friend. tried. We did. Uh, we'll, yeah. we'll talk again on another occasion. We shall. Bye-bye. Have a good one, Glenn.